Ergo Proxy is a meandering story that blindsides viewers with seemingly inconsequential plot elements only to tie everything together at the end to ask us life's biggest question, why are we here? Though this question may have a seemingly straightforward answer at first, I believe that the overall message of Ergo Proxy is that though we all have a reason to exist, we shouldn't look for it because the truth is ugly and finding out will end our lives as we know them forever. Hello Funkers, Tony Funk here, and welcome to my exploration of Ergo Proxy's biggest lesson about purpose. But before I tackle this message, I feel compelled to explain the plot for those who are still understandably confused about the role of proxies, the domes, the boomerang project, and the Cogito virus. Ergo Proxy takes place in the year 7207, 5000 years after humanity's elites left the planet as Earth neared a complete environmental catastrophe. In anticipation of Earth becoming completely uninhabitable, humanity decided to create a backup civilization within Earth that would help accelerate the restoration of planet Earth's ecology. The space-faring humans, known in-universe as the Creators, decided to set up the conditions to house humans within domes on Earth. These domes would house sterile humans who would reproduce via a controlled womb system as a means of ensuring population control within the domes. Considering the fact that the Earth was uninhabitable, the creators developed ultra-powerful beings known as proxies. The proxies were beings with impressive physical feats and unmatched intellect that were programmed by the creators to obey their instructions and create domes with artificial wombs. Their job was to repopulate Earth by creating self-sustainable controlled cities that would generate organic waste in efforts to fertilize the surface of an uninhabitable Earth. Somehow the domes were linked to the proxies considering that after the death of a proxy, the artificial womb within the dome would cease to produce offspring and its corresponding dome would die out. And so, 300 proxies were made by the creators, and as a result, 300 domes were erected around the globe. Sterile humans and proxies weren't the only beings the creators wanted to leave on Earth, however. Autonomous robots called autoraves were thrown into the mix serving a dual purpose. The initial purpose of autoraves were to provide humanity with assistance in surviving everyday life in the domes. However, they were also meant to act as a possible substitute for humanity should the creators die out in space. You see, if both sets of humanity die out, that being the creators and the sterile humans in the domes, at the very least, the creators could introduce a way to give the autoraves free will as a testament of humanity's existence, which is exactly what they did in the form of the Cogito virus. Though in the current timeline of Ergo Proxy, autoraves are being made by the sterile humans, it is implied the technology was passed down from the creators due to the Cogito virus being a creation of theirs. Now that we kind of explained a few basics about these three main components of the Ergo Proxy lore, we must explain Vincent and Riel's backstories as they relate with the Ergo Proxy and serve as the backbone for my argument about the meaning of life. Prior to the event seen in the series, the proxy assigned to the dome city of Romdo, known as Proxy 1, somehow finds out about the creator's plot to end the proxies and their sterile human children in anticipation of their return. Because Proxy 1 realizes that his existence is supposed to be a stand-in for real humans, he is angered and decides to create a proxy whose job would be to kill the creators once they came back to Earth. This proxy is called Ergo Proxy and is referred to as the Proxy of Death. Ergo Proxy was apparently created by Proxy 1 and Monad Proxy, who seem to have been romantically involved with each other. One important thing to point out, however, is that Ergo Proxy, though being an offspring of Monad and Proxy 1, looks like a clone of Proxy 1. This of course causes problems because Ergo Proxy not only looks like Proxy 1, but in fact also carries Proxy 1's memories of what his eventual fate would become. At one point in time, Proxy 1 relinquishes his duties as proxy of the dome city of Romdo to wander the earth, and hands over the reins to Ergo Proxy. Ergo Proxy, doomed to look over Rome Do as a disaffected minion of Proxy 1 and the creators, decides to give up his duties as well, and as the proxy meant to exact revenge on the humans. He then finds a new leader for Rome Do in a sterile human named Donov Mayer, and leaves to wipe his memories and attempts to not be plagued by his unfortunate destiny. This leads Ergo Proxy to the dome city of Mosk, where he encounters Monad. Upon telling Monad about his plans to relinquish his duties as a proxy, Monad decides to sacrifice her life, sort of, to erase Ergo Proxy's memories. She backs up her memories within an autorave named Amnesia, and becomes a living vegetable with no thinking faculties left. It is implied she does this out of love, due to Ergo Proxy being her only son. Ergo Proxy's memories and programmed mission are erased, and he reverts to his human form with an alter ego known as Vincent Law. 
Vincent Law then begins to live life as a human lacking any memories of who he once was. Time passes and Donov Mayer, realizing that Rome Doe can't be sustainable without a proxy, decides to invade Mosk and capture Monad Proxy as a replacement for Ergo Proxy. In the aftermath, this invasion caused a humanitarian crisis in which many of Mosk's citizens were admitted to Rome Doe to live as refugees and work in dangerous sectors of the city. Vincent Law happened to be one of these refugees and begins anew by unwittingly living in the dome he helped to maintain years prior. While under the custody of Donov Mayer, Monad's body is experimented on, disfiguring her in attempts to revive her faculties. This is presumably done to restore Monad and attract Ergo Proxy back to Romdo, considering the fact that Donov could not tell the difference between Ergo and Proxy 1, and assumed Monad was Ergo Proxy's former lover. Donov probably wanted Ergo Proxy back as an extra layer of defense in case the space humans ever came back, considering that Donov learned about their plans to clear the domes in anticipation of their arrival. Under Donov Donov's top scientist, Daedalus, Monad's restoration fails, but as a backup is partially recreated as a half-human, half-proxy hybrid called Riel. Donov decides that Riel is good enough as a means to lure Ergo Proxy back and has Daedalus shelter her, as well as gives her a job in the intelligence bureau of Romdo. Years pass, and leading up to the events of the first episode, Earth's living conditions improve, causing the creators to issue the Awakening Protocol, also known as the Pulse of the Awakening. Soon after it's issued, Proxy's biologies begin to change, causing them to die from exposure to sunlight in anticipation of Earth's thick cloud cover breaking. This isn't everything though. Just in case a vulnerability to sunshine wasn't effective enough, many of the proxies begin to go crazy and either develop self-destructive behaviors or begin to kill other proxies. And thus, the series kicks off during the awakening, after Proxy 1 went out of his way to attack many of the world's domes in attempts to leave as little usable real estate as possible for the creators to use. Okay, so now that we have the obscure background lore out of the way, how is Ergo Proxy telling us that our raison d'être, or our reason to be, is counterintuitive to living a meaningful life? Well, before I go into the real world explanations of this phenomenon, let's first look at how Ergo Proxy demonstrates this phenomenon. Let's start off with auto raves and then the Cogito virus. Throughout the series, we see auto raves fulfill their tasks by helping human counterparts as either entourages, soldiers, or entertainers. Since they were created by humans, they were made for specific tasks in order to contribute efficiently to domed life. It is consistently expressed throughout the series that these tasks are the auto raves raison d'être, or reason for existence. For example, let's take Raoul Creed's entourage Kristeva. Her raison d'être is to assist Raoul Creed in his everyday duties and seems to be very good at it by not expressing any emotion outside of what she's subordinated to do. Because she is an autorave who was not infected by the Cogito virus throughout the majority of the series, she was able to fulfill her duties and avoid a disastrous fate. Iggy, on the other hand, was Riel's entourage who, similarly to Kristeva, excelled in his duties and fulfilled his raison d'être to a T. Eventually, though, Iggy was infected by the Cogito virus and gained an understanding of his own raison d'être by gaining human-like awareness. What's interesting is that, after being infected by the virus, he hides his self-awareness from Riel, knowing that he could be killed if found out while at the same time contemplating his reason to exist. Iggy, much like most infected auto raves, goes crazy after acknowledging that his reason to exist is to solely assist and protect Riel. This causes him to go against Riel's wishes to fly back to Romdo with the collected proxy corpse, and instead, locks Riel up and lectures her about how horrible his existence was because of her. We see how his awareness about the realities of his existence disturb him, because he essentially exists to serve an ungrateful companion who isn't always going to want to be around him. He paradoxically starts harming Riel with his imposed lockdown and decides to kill Vincent out of vengeance for taking Riel's attention from him. The Cogito virus's narrative use is to show how the awareness of one's purpose can drastically change the behavior of an auto rave from contentedness to existential dread and selfishness. The etymology of Cogito comes from Rene Descartes' expression, Cogito ergo sum, meaning, I think therefore I am. This name, then, alludes to the impact of one's awareness about their reason to exist. Auto raves aren't the only ones subject to develop madness with self-awareness. Humans are particularly susceptible to this, as seen with both Donov and Raoul Creed. When we analyze Donov's actions, we realize that his personal goals are to avoid the fate of Romdo's eventual population replacement. One of the most common themes present in the depiction of Romdo life is to become a model citizen, to find a raison d'être, and to do one's tasks well without questioning anything. 
Given that Donov is one of the few individuals both human and proxy to understand that their civilization is existing on borrowed time, it's interesting that he keeps the citizens of Romdo from learning about how inconsequential their existence is, including Raul Creed. Obviously this is due to a fear that he could instigate a societal collapse if the citizens learn that eventually they are to die out and be replaced by real humans. This isn't to say that Donov is somehow unaffected by the revelation, and therefore wise enough to keep everyone else in the dark about the proxies and creators. Donov is actually an evil man, orchestrating a genocidal war against the city of Mosk in order to obtain Monad and prolong the existence of Romdo until he could lure Ergo Proxy and establish an alliance with him. This means that Donov, upon learning about the proxy project, turned into a genocidal maniac hellbent on self-preservation. Unlike Raul Creed, though. Raul Creed, on the other hand, became self-destructive upon learning the truth. Creed starts off as a well-composed and competent director general of the Citizen Security Bureau, but becomes hell-bent on capturing Vincent Law after he's tipped off about the existence of proxies. His curiosity to uncover the truth causes him to work against Regent Donov behind the scenes, and though there's actually nothing wrong about working against the government to uncover the truth, it's how his behavior shifts once he learns about the truth. His ethically questionable actions cease to look heroic after he becomes dead set on killing Proxy 1. We even see his mental state deteriorate and hallucinate Vincent Law throughout the final episodes of the series. And finally, we have Proxy 1. Proxy 1 goes mad after learning that his offspring won't be inheritors of the Earth, and though it's understandable that he would have beef with the creators for setting a time limit for his existence, Proxy 1's reactions seem kind of counterintuitive. You see, Proxy 1, in an attempt to exact revenge, was also responsible for the killing of countless domes in efforts to reduce the creator's chances of survival after returning to Earth. What's interesting is that Proxy 1's behavior shows that he no longer cares about Romdo's people, nor the permanence of life on Earth, but rather cares about rewriting history as the one who punished humanity for deciding proxies were to have a biological clock just like humans, and literally any other creature on Earth. Basically, bro is mad because everything dies and survival is predicated on a life-death cycle. Pretty petty if you ask me. And though the creators are not absolved of any blame, after all, they did leave swaths of humanity behind or to mutate in caves, they also really didn't have any more humane options to keep the spark of life alive. Obviously on paper, the more reasonable action would be to somehow keep the proxies alive, but I don't believe it would have been ethical to keep only one class of beings immortal either, especially when resources were highly limited. But okay, everyone who discovers the reality of their purpose goes crazy in Ergo Proxy. That seems to be pretty clear, but why portray this message in the first place? I think the message of Ergo Proxy is ultimately to live one's life to the fullest. We hear time and again about finding our purpose in life, but the reality is that if we all lived according to our purpose, we would justify acts of war, cruelty, and selfishness, because ultimately, in the same way that the sterile dome human's purpose was to maintain the creator's eventual shelters, our purpose is simply to reproduce and ensure that our offspring can pass on our genes. We've all heard of survival of the fittest. You see, life is intrinsically transient, and our biologies don't care about helping sick people, nor animals, nor traveling the world, nor making art. Our biologies care about eating, sleeping, and making babies. And the more we look into our raison d'etre as a species, the uglier and more disappointing the revelation becomes. Religion has done a great job of giving us a raison d'etre beyond selfishness, which is why the auto raves infected with the Cogito virus make prayer poses when they're near proxies. I think this symbolizes how a belief in a force greater than ourselves can overcome a belief in our biological drivers to be the most fit to survive by all means necessary. But in the same way that once characters understood that the proxies were transient, they would become unstable and violent, the world's rapid secularization is returning us to our biological purposes. At the very least, that's how selfish people justify their actions. But even though the truth about our nature sucks, it doesn't mean we have to embrace it. Though Pino loses her raison d'etre when she's infected and separated from Raoul, she chooses to ignore the loss and works towards becoming more human. Though Cristeva loses Raoul, she chooses to take care of Pino. Though Riel learns that she was a test tube creature made for the sole purpose of getting Ergo Proxy to side with Romdo, Romdo collapses and she decides to live and embark on an adventure. And though Vincent Law's purpose had finally expired, he chose not to disintegrate in the sunlight, but rather brave the aftermath of his world shattering to find something new to live for. You see, Funkers, we all have a purpose in life, but ultimately it's way better if we ignore it. And instead, follow our hearts and be happy in our dome, sweet dome.